the Wasto Indians, who lived pre-registered Y on the Savannah River during the second half of the 17th century, are mentioned in only a small number of primary documents. There are no known Wasto archaeological sites, not a single artifact can be linked with the group. No more than a single word of their language is known to us today. In the secondary literature the Westos are discussed infrequently, and then only in academic books and journals. Other southern Indian peoples, such as the Creeks and Cherokees, receive popular media attention and are well known among the general public. Of course, one can talk with a Creek or Cherokee Indian today. While the Westos were already a distant southern memory in the 19th century, it is apparent from the extant evidence, however, that the Westos, who migrated to the region from around Lake Erie in 1656, had a profound effect on the development of the colonial south in the 17th century. Attempting to elucidate the history of a group using so little primary evidence presents a number of Sunni currency canned obstacles, and in the case of the Westos only some of these obstacles can be overcome, and then only partially. Perhaps the biggest problem in studying the Westos is determining which documents actually concern the group, since Europeans referred to them by a variety of names. Throughout this work, I will argue as to which documents should be used to reconstruct the history of the Westos. Excerpts from 19 of these documents have been reproduced in an appendix for readers who wish to consult them directly. In reading through these documents, a number of problems are readily apparent. In most instances, corroborating documents do not exist. The documents that do exist refer almost exclusively to the subjects of con registered act and trade. They were all written by either the Lord's proprietors of the Carolina colony, who never set eyes on a Westo Indian, or by no more than two dozen Carolinians, and this is a generous estimate. It should be noted, however, that most of those Carolinians did have direct contact with the Westos, and some of them were among the keenest observers in the colony. Because of the small number and limited scope of the extant documents, the reader will encounter both inference and speculation in this reconstruction of Westo history. Considerable care has gone into that inference and speculation, and I believe I have presented the most plausible story according to the available information. It is my hope that this work will help to frame future research concerning the vitally important period of Indian slavery in the colonial South. Before examining the place of Westo history within the larger context of the colonial South, however, a brief summary of the group's movements and activities is in order. The group that would come to be known in the South as the Westo's currency RST entered the historical record as the Erie in the 1630s, Thwaites 1896, 1901 to 8:115. During the 1640s, the Erie, who lived in the vicinity of the lake that now bears their name, pursued a trading partnership with the Susquehannock Indians of northern Chesapeake Bay. The Erie exchanged beaver pelts for European manufactured items the Susquehannocks were receiving from the Virginians, including currency rearms, green 1998 hours 10 minutes minus 11, Hoffman. 1964-201-204, was leisure 1961-117. Other Indian groups, most notably the powerful Five Nations Iroquois of New York, were also trading with Europeans at various colonial outposts throughout the Northeast. The insatiable European demand for beaver belts quickly led to plummeting beaver populations, which in turn greatly increased competition between native groups participating in the trade. Richter 1992 hours 57 minutes, Starna 1991 to 247.
trigger 1978 to 352 to 353. The violent con register dicks that resulted from this competition are known collectively as the Beaver Wars. The Erie, despite their access to European guns, did not fare well in the Beaver Wars. In 1656, after a protracted struggle with the Five Nations, Iroquois, the Erie were forced to abandon their homeland and move south. Beyond the ire of their enemies, Alvord and Bidgood 1912-155, Thwaites. 1896-1901-47-59. Shortly after arriving on the southwest frontier of Virginia, the Erie, known to Virginians as the Rich Achrians, forged a trading partnership with the commander of Fort Henry, Abraham Wood, Crane. 1929 hours 12 minutes. The Virginians desired not only beaver pelts but also Indian slaves to work their tobacco currency elds, worth 1,995 hours 17 minutes. By 1,659 the rich Acreans had relocated to present southern Georgia to facilitate slave raids against the Indians of Spanish Florida, Orangzi Coates 1659 a, worth 1,995 hours 18 minutes. Southern Indian groups provided good targets for slave raids because they did not have access to large numbers of European currency rearms at this time. In the mid-1660s, after years of raids along the Spanish frontier, the rich Acreans moved to the Savannah River along the present boundary of Georgia and South Carolina, ostensibly to exploit a new source of potential slaves worth 1,995 hours 18 minutes. The term Westos was originally recorded in early 1,670 by the currency RST. Settlers of Carolina, where local Indians used it to refer to the slave raiding. Rich Acreans, Chiefs 1897-166. to Between 1663 and 1674 the Westos assaulted coastal Indian groups in order to steal corn and capture native people, whom they transported to Virginia and sold into slavery, Chiefs. 1897-194. Terry Currency and local Indians were forced to seek the protection of the newly established Carolina colony against further assaults, Chiefs 1897-168. 194, 200 to 201. In 1674, however, the Lord's proprietors of Carolina established a trade with the Westos, stipulating that slaves were only to be taken from interior Indian groups on a eid to Carolina, Chiefs 1897. 456 to 462. Between 1674 and 1680 the Lord's proprietors fought bitterly with Carolina. Planters over control of the Indian trade, Chiefs 1897-445-446, Sally. 1928-1-100-104-107. The proprietors' monopoly on trade with the Westos infuriated Carolinian planters because exporting deerskins, beaver, pelts, and Indian slaves was perhaps the most lucrative economic activity occurring in the colony at the time. The West owes military advantage over other native groups had to be overcome, however, before the planters could usurp control of the trade from the Lord's proprietors. Toward this end, in 1680 a group of planters currents enhanced a secret war against the Westos, forcing the group to abandon their 40 currency ed town on the Savannah River, Sally. 1928-1-104-107, to 115-116, to 116. by 1682 there were reported to be only 50 Westo warriors remaining in the south. Sally 1911 to 182 to 183 several
8,000 southern Indians had been enslaved before the end of the West O. War in 1682, however, and up until that war the West O's had been the principal. Indian slavers in the region, Galay 2002-294-296. These slave raids had a Sunni currency can't effect on native peoples of the Lower South, but anthropologists and historians have been slow to recognize their importance because of the scarcity of documentation. Even when scholars have noted that the Westos were quite in registradential. During the early years of the Carolina colony, they have failed to ask important questions concerning the nature of Westo and registradents and how the Westos came to possess it. By expanding our view of the situation to include political and economic interactions between Europeans and Indians. Throughout all of Eastern North America during the 17th century, a much clearer picture of the history of the Westos can be gleaned. What specie currency C advantages did the Westos possess? What circumstances afforded them these advantages, and how were they eventually compromised? What Specie currency C effects did the Westos have on other groups, both Indian and European? Finally, and perhaps most importantly, what can the history of the Westos tell us about the nature of the early colonial South and the reasons behind the eventual triumph of the English in the region? The 17th century transformation. By the beginning of the 18th century, the South had become nearly unrecognizable in comparison to what it had been when the Westo's currency RST began launching slave raids into Florida circa 1659. At that time, despite a century of Spanish colonial occupation and native population losses due to epidemics, there was still a great deal of diversity among the sedentary farmers of the Lower South. By 1700, However, much of that diversity had disappeared. Between 1659 and 1680, when the Westos were at the height of their enregistered ends, several thousand Indians from colonial Spanish Florida and its frontier were captured and sold, Galay 2002-295-296. In all probability, the Westos captured the majority of those enslaved refugees of Westo raids, and later those of their successors in the slave trade, were generally left with only two options, to seek the protection of the Spanish or English settlers or to join with other native groups in order to form polities large enough to lend a measure of protection against slavers. During the 17th century, these aggregates of various native peoples developed essentially new social identities, becoming the Indian peoples of the Old South, Creeks, Catawbas, Chickasaws, Choctaws, Cherokees, and so on. Although there were cultural continuities between the native societies of the 16th and 18th centuries, no one can reasonably dispute that the 16th century Kusa chiefdom bore little resemblance to the 18th century Upper Creek town of Coosa. John Worth has recently argued that the rise of the Indian slave trade in the Lower South forced a fundamental change in local production. Worth. 2002 A colon 9. Between AD 1000 and 1600, Southern chiefdoms traditionally planted, harvested, and stored two crops of corn each year, a practice that seems to have been vital to the continuance of Chi registered Y organization. During the 17th century, the agricultural economy of the South's ancient chiefdoms gave way to a commercial hunting economy in which warfare, hunting, and trading had primacy over farming. Commercial hunting and slaving required a degree of mobility that earlier Southerners had not exercised. It seems likely that this level of mobility would have made it diff currency cult to plant, store, and protect two crops of corn each year, a fact that may have contributed to a weakening of the traditional social hierarchy.
most. Southern Indians even changed their traditional winter house architecture. During the 17th century, abandoning the use of semi-subterranean registered ORs except in the case of the public rotunda, Waisalkov 1994-195. In the four decades since the Westhos had been forced to abandon their homeland near Lake Erie, the South had taken on many of the characteristics common in the Northeast during the development of the fur trade. First, the number of native polities decreased dramatically, with only the larger aggregate polities surviving. Second, virtually every male Indian in the region possessed a currency rearm by the beginning of the 18th century. Something John Lawson noted on his long journey through the Carolina backcountry in 1701, as did Thomas Nairn on his foray to the Mississippi River in 1708, Lawson 1967 hours 33 minutes, 38, 175. Nairn 1988 hours 37 minutes minus 38. Further, alliances with European traders became of utmost political importance, since it was essential to maintain access to powder and shot. With the arrival of the French on the Gulf Coast in 1699, the South included several competing European groups who could be played off one another. Finally, the commercial hunting and slaving economy had the ability to affect groups located far from European settlements, even groups who had little, if any direct contact with Europeans themselves. For example, La Salle encountered Indians in possession of English guns during his exploration of the Mississippi River in 1682, 16 years before Naren became the currency RST Carolinian to see the Great River. The decided military advantage of the Westos was an integral part of the engine that propelled this change, creating a powerful stimulus for other Indian groups to attempt to acquire currency rearms. By the time the Westos were defeated in 1680, the need for European arms and ammunition had become pervasive in the South. When the coalescent polities that developed as a result of Westo aggression obtained Sunni currency cant numbers of currency rearms, they began their own slaving campaigns against neighboring groups. Many small native societies were destroyed as a result of such raids, while others were absorbed into one of a handful of larger polities that were increasing their numbers through coalescence. The dramatic lessening of social diversity by 1700 is a testament to the success of the second generation of Southern Indian slavers. Aggregate groups such as the Creeks and Catawbas survived the currency now turbulent quarter of the 17th century, but many of their neighbors, including the Gwal, the Mokama, the Timakua, and the Kalusa, became extinct worth 2002 a colon 11. It is clear that Sunni currency can't changes occurred among southern Indian societies. During the 17th century, changes fundamental enough to warrant collectively referring to this process as the 17th century transformation. With the exception of the work of Werner Crane, however, the importance of the Westo's slave raiding in the early development of the colonial South has essentially gone unrecognized outside the currency eld of anthropology. Much like 18th century scholars of South Carolina, 20th century historians tend to mention the Westos infrequently, generally using Crane as their source, Edgar 1998, Wallace 1951. It is not just the Westos who are slighted by historians but Carolina history in general. Before the turn of the 18th century, when documentata more abundant. The exception to this rule is the recent work of Alan Galay, who has recognized the importance of the 17th century Indian slave trade in the development and eventual dominance of the English Empire. In the American South, Galay 2002. Galay clearly demonstrates for
the currency RSD time the effects of the Indian slave trade on the lives and livelihoods of the English, French, and Spanish colonists of the 17th century. The native actors in the drama, however, have proven more diff currency cult. To understand, archaeologists have fared little better in explaining the reasons for the widespread transformation of southern natives during the 17th century. During the 1960s and 1970s, the accepted idea of most southeastern archaeologists concerning the introduction of European trade goods can be best summarized by Carol Mason's description of the trade goods collection. From the Okamulgi town site, occupied between approximately 1690 and 1715, the new articles brought to the creeks through trade did not present them a new technology at all. The new artifacts, manufactured by processes unknown to the Indians and probably unimportant to them, simply substituted for the aboriginal artifacts within the framework of an essentially aboriginal technology and aboriginal economic system. Changes, of course, did occur as a result of the introduction of these new tools but only insofar as the new tools intensity currency ed. Through increased F currency she'd see an already existing means of exploiting the environment. Mason 1963 to 78. These ideas may seem rather short-sighted today, but they were an improvement over previously long-held beliefs, namely, that native peoples simply could not resist the far superior technology of Europeans, that Indian dependency on European manufactured products was thus inevitable, and that natives were easily duped by European traders who bought North America from them for glass beads and metal hatchets. The work of Mason and her contemporaries did much to correct these misconceptions, but, as often occurs in scientific currency sea research, the correction turned out to be an overcorrection. It is certainly true that native peoples exercised judgment, preference, and discernment when dealing with Europeans and European manufactured products. They also modi currency ed some of those trade goods so they would conform to an aboriginal function or aesthetic. Bamforth 1993 hours 53 minutes, Wilson and Rogers 1993. When considering Worth's argument above, however, one cannot sustain the interpretation that the economic system at work in the 17th century was an aboriginal economic system and that the new technology only increased the F currency she'd see of a system of exploitation already in place. During the end becomes 1980s, two southeastern archaeologists in particular, Vernon James Knight and Gregory Weslakov, attempted to improve upon Mason's model of native cultural change during the 17th century. During his work on the historic creek town of Tukabachi, Knight recognized that the common practice of concentrating prestige items in the hands of a ruling lineage during the 16th century had given way in the 17th century to what he called an economics of ostentation. Knight 1985-172-177. A chief could not control the pro-currency TS of a commercial hunting economy in the same manner as land, agricultural labor, and rare minerals. The presence of European goods in a large percentage of late 17th and early 18th century Creek burials attests to a marked decrease of social strati currency cation in comparison to the southern Indian societies that had occupied the same region as recently as the 16th century. Pluck in 1997 to 275 to 277, Smith 1987 to 101 to 103, Waislkov 1994 to 194 to 195. At Tihi same time that Chi registered Y power was on Tihi Wayne. The unregistered dents of young warriors rose in relation to the growth of European 
trade. Part of the reason for this was the fact that many war parties now served as raids to capture plunder to sell to Europeans, allowing younger men many more opportunities than were traditionally available to them to gain in status and wealth. Night 1985 to 175 to 180. William Fenton noted that a similar process occurred during the Beaver Wars in the Northeast. Fenton 1978 to 315 to 316. Thus it appears that there is a degree of validity to the idea of an economics of ostentation, especially considering the fact that Spanish trade goods had been making their way into the interior through native middlemen for nearly a century before the appearance of the Westos in the lower south. Although, as noted earlier, the Spanish-Indian trade never approached the level of that of the English, they did manufacture items speci currency. Cali for the trade in Florida, including brass prestige items such as disc, gorgets, armbands, and tubular beads. Waislkov 1989 to 121 to 127. These items all entered the social realm of interior native groups without the intrusion of the Spaniards who manufactured them and were incorporated into native societies according to traditional values. Waislkov 1994 to 194. This is only part of the story, however as the situation changed dramatically with the arrival of the Westos in the region. Implicit in the concept of an economics of ostentation is the idea that native peoples exercised choice in selectively adopting particular items of European material culture. However, when currency rearms were introduced to the Lower South and used to capture Indian slaves, choice was largely removed from the equation. It is diff currency cult to pinpoint precisely when the political entity known in the 18th century as the Creek Confederacy formed, since it was likely a gradual process and is not directly re registered in the archaeological record. Night 1994. The Confederacy, however, was also a social entity, and by the 18th century a widespread similarity in material culture had developed in Creek towns despite the generally independent nature of those towns, Waislkov 1994-194. It is likely that the social foundation for the Creek Confederacy developed during the period in which Spanish goods were reaching the interior but before the Westos entered the region. The Westos then served as a potent mechanism that accelerated the development of the Creek Confederacy as a political entity. This idea is contrary to the currently popular theory that the social and political aspects of the Confederacy developed together, Waislkov 1994-194. The archaeological evidence indicates that a social base for the Confederacy was in place before the 18th century, but, as noted above, it is silent concerning politics. It has only been assumed that social similarity was indicative of political cohesion, and this is a weak assumption. As chiefdoms went into steep decline, there was little reason to form or maintain widespread political relationships. Based on mutual defense, the advent of the slave trade, however, changed that fact completely. The English did not use the terms Upper Creeks and Lower Creeks. Until the 18th century, Braun 1993 to 6 to 7. During the 17th century, groups that were part of the Creek Nation in the 18th century were known by names such as the Oshasis, Hitchitis, Akmulgis, Kawitas, as well as dozens of others. The same was true of the Catawba Nation. Before the 18th century, Carolinians referred to the peoples who would come to be known as the Catawbas by a variety of names, including Asaws, Waterese, Congarees, and Sugarees, Merrill 1989-92-133. Certainly natives still identity currency ed themselves by a variety of names during
the 18th century, but Europeans often used the more general terms. Although this sort of evidence is far from conclusive, it does support the idea that the development of the well-known Indian confederacies of the 18th century occurred as a reaction to the Indian slave trade. How unbearable it must have been to go about your livelihood if your neighbor two miles away was willing to capture you and sell you as a slave. With that in mind, it is not diff currency cult to imagine that the volatile nature of the commercial slave trade forced neighboring groups into anti-aggression tax for the purpose of mutual defense. So, it can be said that neither historians nor archaeologists have adequately understood or described the rapid changes undergone by native groups during the second half of the 17th century in the lower south. The main reason for this is the fact that this period resists interpretation by traditional methods. Historians are uncomfortable with the 17th century because relatively few written documents from the period have survived, and archaeologists sometimes have diff currency culty understanding. The latter half of the century because the time scale during which the changes occurred was so short. We know that between about AD 1000 and 1600, societies in the lower south were grouped into centrally organized, socially strati currency ed chiefdoms, ruled by powerful, noble lineages. Hudson 1997 hours 11 minutes minus 30. We also know that during the 18th century, southern Indians were essentially egalitarian and organized into somewhat loose confederacies of independent towns. The dominant political units in these societies were councils of men who governed through the consensus of their fellow villagers, Braun 1993-3-25. To continue an earlier analogy, it is unlikely that an 18th century Creek Indian from the town of Kusa would know how to get along socially in the 16th century chiefdom of Kusa. The question that needs to be answered is, what shaped the Indians of the 18th century South, Hudson 2002, 12? In order to answer that question, we must illuminate the processes at work during the 17th century transformation, which means that we must currency and the way to work in the period utilizing less documentation and archaeological evidence than might be desired. Charles Hudson is of the opinion that the Annales paradigm, developed by French social historian Fernand Brauyoudl, would be the most fruitful approach for understanding the 17th century. Since this research paradigm is capable of taking on world-sized systems, grappling with exotic social orders, with spotty documentation, reconstructing communities in the remote past, and examining the surface of life in remote areas, Hudson, 2002, 15, Brauyudl, Mark Bloch, and others employed a research method that allowed a rich context to be teased out from a wide variety of evidence. Block 1953, 1964, Braudel 1975, 1979, 1980. Employing such a method for the 17th century South is best begun by pre-registered Y examining the three basic European colonizing strategies, the fur trade in the Northeast the Spanish mission system in Florida, and the plantation system and Indian trade in the South, Hudson 2002, 24-35. The Northeastern Fur Trade As early as 1534, Europeans currency shing the waters of the Gulf of St. Lawrence began trading iron tools to the local Indians in exchange for beaver pelts which the currency shermen could sell back home to increase the pro-currency T of their expeditions, trigger 1978 to 346. The demand for such belts in Europe by the latter half of the 16th century prompted shipowners to begin undertaking journeys up the St. Lawrence River for the sole purpose of
Trading with Native Peoples, Trigger 1978-346. The Pelts of Beavers, Because of their unique felting qualities and waterproof nature, were the most highly regarded, Outwater 1996-5. Beavers secrete oil known as castrum, which was sought for use as an ingredient in medicines and perfumes. Outwater 1996-5. Europeans of the time also ate the register dash of beavers. Even considering the tail to be a delicacy, Outwater 1996-5. By the mid-1500s beavers had been an important item of commerce in Europe for several centuries, and only Siberia and Scandinavia still contained large beaver populations, Outwater 1996-4-6. The New World, on the other hand, had enormous beaver populations, and the French, Dutch, and English were not long in developing a thriving commerce in peltry throughout the Northeast. The currency RST important New World trading post was located at the French port of Tadesque, downriver from present Quebec, but by 1624 the Dutch had established New Netherland and had built a fort on the Hudson River. Near its juncture with the Mohawk River, Wilcoxon 1981-4-8. At about the same time, to the north and south, the English established trading posts. In both the Massachusetts and Chesapeake Bays, Richter 1992 hours 51 minutes. Before 1630, three large trading companies had been founded in the area, the Dutch West India Company, the Company of New France, and the Massachusetts Bay Company. Richter 1992 hours 58 minutes. European competition for control of the fur trade had dramatic effects on the native populations of the Northeast, stimulating increased hostilities, long distance migrations, and the coalescence of disparate groups. Trigger 1978 to 347. The Huron Indians were the main trading partners of the French in the early decades of the 17th century, supplying them with about 12,000 beaver pelts a year, trigger 1978 to 349. During this same period, Virginians established a trade with the Susquehannocks, whose territory lay just to the north of Chesapeake Bay, Faust's 1,984 hours 11 minutes minus 12. In both cases, these trade partnerships remained fairly stable until about mid-century, when the expanding scale of the trade literally forced every native group into participation. Conversely, access to the Dutch at Fort Orange on the Hudson River was contested from the outset. In 1628, after violently displacing the Mohican peoples who lay between them and Fort Orange, the Mohawks of the Five Nations Iroquois became the preeminent trading partners of the Dutch, Richter 1992 hours 55 minutes minus 56, trigger 1969. Having met with success in their military campaign against the Mohicans, the Mohawks began a decades-long blockade of major trading paths in the region where they stole already processed belts in piratical raids against Indians. Traveling to European trading posts, Hudson 2002, 28. The Mohawks were aided in this endeavor by the other members of the Five Nations. Iroquois, the Onidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas. The aggressive strategy of the Five Nations, which was adopted successfully, by a handful of other polities, often forced populations less strategically placed to undertake long-distance migrations in order to survive the onslaught of Iroquois raids. Once the English and Dutch began illegally dealing Sunni currency canned numbers of currency rearms to the Five Nations during the 1640s in a bidding war to win the allegiance of the native confederacy. Their depredations grew substantially, trigger 1978 to 354.
the European. Demand for peltry was large enough that it led to extremely low beaver. Populations in many areas of the northeast during the 17th century, including Huronia by 1630 and Iroquois by about 1640, Richter 1992 hours 57 minutes. Trigger 1978 to 352 to 353. This stimulated wider ranging raids by the five nations, who sought to maintain access to belts while simultaneously preventing other natives from accessing European traders, start a 1991 to 247. Because they possessed more currency rearms than any other native group in the region, the Five Nations Iroquois were able to systematically displace a number of Indian groups during the mid-17th century Beaver Wars. Groups displaced included the Winrose, 1638, the Hurons, 1649, the Patons, 1650, the Neutrals, 1651, and the Aries, 1656, Richter 1992. 61 to 62. Jasper Dakertz, who traveled extensively in the Mid Atlantic colonies. During 1679 and 1680, wrote these telling remarks about the Northeastern gun trade in his journal. Because the Indians desired them, guns, so much, they gave everything. They had to acquire them, add to this the insatiable and cursed greed of the Europeans who sold them guns and other weapons, and at much higher prices because it was forbidden to do so. Even those appointed to uphold the law and punish smugglers, which they did, brought currency rearms over by the thousands for sale, including governors and directors. It was also the case if one nation did not do it, then the others located around it did, such as the English and French, so that now the Indians are all equipped with them, guns, and are as accustomed to carrying them as Europeans. Snow et al. 1996 to 209. By 1650, Virginians had long been interested in the Indian trade, but the bulk of their commercial exchange took place at the northern end of the Chesapeake Bay with the Susquehannock peoples. The Chesapeake Bay represented the southern terminus of the northeastern beaver and gun trade, and Virginia Susquehannock interactions took place in that context. The Virginians only began to look for new Indian trading partners in the south after the Powhatan Confederacy was permanently fragmented in 1645. At the same time, Mid-century economic circumstances forced Virginia tobacco farmers to seek cheap labor for their currency elds. This fact combined with the appearance of the West O's on Virginia's southwestern border to create a situation in which the seed of the Indian slave trade could take root and grow. The Spanish missions of Florida before the French, English, and Dutch developed the fur trade in the Northeast, the Spanish established themselves in the Lower South. Arigi. Nally colonized to support and defend Spanish ships traveling to Europe. From Mexico and Peru, Florida was at the far end of Spain's American Empire, and it received attention and funding from the Crown as be currency to its geographic position, Hudson 2002, 25. Spain's colonization model, based on the mission system that had worked so successfully in Central and South America, was implemented in Florida, but with less pro-currency table results. Whereas in the former areas there were precious metals that could be seized as instant wealth and native empires with populations in the millions that could be exploited, in Florida there was neither. At its height, the Mission system in Florida amounted to no more than about 40 Christian towns spread throughout three provinces, including about 26,000 Indians, 300 Spanish soldiers, and even fewer priests. 
Bushnell 1989-138. These missionaries and their native register docks were thinly spread from coastal missions. As far north as Carolina and as far west as the Apalachicola River in the panhandle of present Florida. In other words, they were not ideally suited to prevent the depredations of the Westos. Further, because it was illegal to trade arms and ammunition to native peoples along the Spanish frontier, the Indians were at a military disadvantage to the northern invaders. The scale of Spanish-Indian trade in Florida remained small due to the fact that much of the legally sanctioned trade took place within the con currency ness of the mission system, where it served an important role in diplomacy. Bushnell 1989-134-135. In the Americas, Spain administered its colonies by supporting and manipulating the infrastructure of indigenous social systems, a tactic that had worked extremely well in the state-level societies of Central and South America, Hudson 2002. 25. But the chiefdom level societies of northern Florida were not as ideally suited for this type of top down control, so the friars sought to strengthen the power of chiefs through trade. The distribution of prestige items by chiefs was an indigenous trait of these polities. By replacing traditional items of prestige with Spanish manufactured goods, the friars bound the chiefs to the mission system. That prestige was a central factor in the trade is supported by the fact that most of the Spanish trade goods recovered archaeologically are items of personal adornment. Many of these were made out of copper, long held in the southeast to be a material associated with prestige, including such items as gorgets, bracelets, collars, and armbands. Weselkov. 1989-121-127. Spanish government of currency shoals and soldiers, however, also sought commerce with Indians, but with different ends in mind. By the mid-17th century, Spanish goods had penetrated at least as far into the interior as the fall line, by a variety of means. One of the most important of these was Direct trade between Appalachian Indians and crewmen of ships arriving from Havana to the port of San Marcos on the Gulf Coast of Florida. Dressed deer skins and native food items were generally exchanged for luxuries such as those noted above, but also possibly for items such as rum or arms and ammunition. Weselkov 1989-118. Soldiers were also sometimes given trade goods as pay, which they were allowed to exchange with Indians for food or other items, Bushnell 1981-105-106. Throughout the 17th century, friars and government of currency shulls continually accused each other of pro-currency ting from illegal sources of trade, Bushnell 1981-105-106. Han 1988 hours 22 minutes, 32, 142, 183. The Franciscans claim that of currency shoals sent soldiers on trading expeditions into the interior, while the of currency shoals claimed that friars used Appalachians as middlemen and burden bearers in a trade with non mission Indians. Although illegal, Private trade from ships stocked at San Marcos probably constituted the main source from which Spanish guns could have been obtained by native peoples. The 60-odd currency rearms seen in the possession of the Tomatans in 1673 may have come from San Marcos, since they had groove frizzons characteristic of 17th-century Spanish guns, Alvord. And Bidgood 1912 to 214, Weselkov 1989 to 120 to 121. Wives of deceased soldiers had the right to sell their husbands' currency rearms and may have occasionally traded them to Indians. Bushnell 1981 to 9. The friars may even.
have distributed some guns to natives in order to increase their hunting. F. Currency Shinsi, Waislkov 1989-121. On at least one occasion currency rearms were given to mission Indians to help repel an attack by natives from the interior. Though the implication was that this was only for the duration of the battle, worth 1,995 hours 31 minutes. It is diff currency cult to imagine, however, that this clandestine traff currency sea in arms ever approached the level or intensity of the legal and illegal gun trade in the Northeast. This conclusion is supported by the paucity of archaeological evidence of the presence of Spanish guns in the interior, Waislkov 1989-121. This underscores the most important aspect of the Spanish mission system. As it relates to the Westo's livelihood, the inability of the friars to shape Indian societies at a distance, Hudson 2002, 25. When the Westo's, armed with European guns, arrived in the Lower South in the 1650s they encountered only bow and arrow Indians who had very little experience with the loud and destructive weapons of the Europeans. Such weapons in the hands of determined Indian slave raiders had a destabilizing effect on the region's population. Despite the fact that Spain had maintained a continual presence in Florida since 1565, neither its mission Indians nor those beyond the mission's borders were prepared to deal with the onslaught of armed northern groups forced south as a result of the Beaver Wars, the plantation system and Indian trade in the south. The founding of the Carolina colony in 1670 introduced to the lower south the plantation system, a system that would quickly come to dominate the region. Named in honor of King Charles II, Carolina has often been called a colony of a colony because of its close connection with Barbados and other Caribbean islands, Edgar 1998 hours 35 minutes, Galay 2002 hours 42 minutes minus 43. Wood 1974-5. A group of investors known as the Barbadian Adventurers commissioned some of the earliest explorations of the Carolina coast in 1663, and Barbadians established a short-lived colony on the Cape Fear River in 1666, Edgar 1998 hours 40 minutes, when Carolina was permanently established. Four years later, many of its original number were from England, but more than half of the white immigrants to the colony over the next two Decades hailed from Barbados, Edgar 1998 hours 48 minutes. In fact, more than 50 Barbadian planters sent family members and associates to Carolina, Edgar 1998 hours 48 minutes. Because of this, Barbadian culture had a deep and pervasive in register dense on the economic, social, and political development of the new English colony. Carolina offered much in the way of natural resources that were scarce or unavailable in the Caribbean, and a great deal of the early economic activity of the colony centered around providing raw materials to its Barbadian investors. The experiences of other English settlements along the Atlantic coast had shown Carolina's lords proprietors that it might take several years to begin turning a large pro-currency tea through agricultural exports. In the meantime, they looked for other ways to gain income for the colony. Timber Exports to Barbados, which had long since been deforested through the expansion of sugarcane currency elds, provided the currency RSD source of income, Chiefs. 1897-182-183 to Sally 1911 to 158, Wallace 1951 to 79 to 81. Besides timber for fuel, staves, and shingles, the colony also exported naval stores such as tar, pitch, and turpentine, 
an enterprise that would continue to be pro-currency table. For Carolina until the 20th century, Edgar 1998 to 138 to 139. In addition to the products that could be extracted from it, the forest was also used as pasture for free roaming cattle and hogs, which were in high demand. In the Caribbean, beyond the initial investment, the enterprise of free-range cattle ranching required very little overhead since the stocks food was provided by the forest and a few workers or slaves could take care of a large herd, Edgar 1998 to 133. In general, Carolinians were blessed with large tracts of land but were short on both capital and labor, Edgar 1998 to 134, whereas other Atlantic coast colonies were also poor in labor and capital but rich in land, they did not share Carolina's Benny currency tea of close proximity to island colonies whose very geography demanded that they import many of the items most essential to their needs. Carolina land was also important to Caribbean colonists for reasons beyond the products that were exported from it. The abundance of land acted as a lure for experienced colonists who could not gain access to more acreage on the relatively small, circumscribed Caribbean islands. Barbados had only 100,000 acres of land suitable for commercial agricultural production, so even the wealthiest plantation owners generally owned less than 200 acres, Edgar 1998 hours 43 minutes minus 44. In contrast, the Lord's proprietors of Carolina could offer generous land grants to incoming colonists. During the early years of Carolina, the Lord's proprietors offered a head right of 150 acres for each adult male a settler brought into the colony, including himself, and 100 acres for each adult female and any male under. 16, Edgar 1998 hours 43 minutes Although this was later reduced to 50 acres for all adults, it still represented an opportunity to gain land that did not exist in the crowded West Indies, Edgar 1998 hours 43 minutes. The combination of land availability and the loose control of Carolina's proprietary government created many opportunities for ambitious men to advance their estates. That is, because Carolina was controlled by a group of proprietors and not the crown, advancement through the royal patronage system, common in many other English colonies, was not possible, and men of means who immigrated to Carolina generally did so with the purpose of enlarging their fortunes, Galay 2002-63, because they had no prospect of royal appointments or advancements. Carolina planters were often willing to ignore proprietary instructions and directives when doing so increased their pro-currency tea margin, Galay 2002-63. Carolina offered a place for Caribbean planters to expand the system they had developed in the Lesser Antilles on the islands of St. Christopher, Barbados, and Nevis during the early and middle decades of the 17th century. Edgar 1998 hours 36 minutes. The in-register ducks of experienced planters to Carolina. After its establishment in 1670, especially those from Barbados, resulted in marked differences between Carolina society and that of New England and the Chesapeake. Edgar 1998 hours 36 minutes because of their small size and distant location from Europe, Barbados and the other Caribbean colonies developed without much interference from the British Crown, which was interested only in the products of the islands. In such an atmosphere, restraints of any sort, whether governmental or social, seemed to disappear. The pursuit of wealth and the pleasures it could purchase was the order of the day. Edgar 1998 hours 37 minutes. The Barbadian society that emerged 
from this mill you counted material success, not honor, as the most important social measure of a man's worth. Besides the Caribbean's relative isolation, the introduction of sugarcane as the major cash crop was perhaps the single most important factor in the development of Barbadian society. Edgar 1998 hours 37 minutes. When sugarcane became the major commercial crop in Barbados, the colony's prosperity rose dramatically. Previously, Barbados had struggled to develop a pro-currency table agricultural export, failing in the commercial cultivation of both cotton and tobacco. Sugarcane, however, was an instant success. After it was brought to the island during the 1640s, 15 years after the colony's inception, Edgar 1998 hours 37 minutes, sugar and its byproducts, such as rum and molasses, were in high demand throughout the world. Once an F currency should means for planting, harvesting, and processing sugar cane was developed. Barbados quickly became known as the wealthiest of England's colonies in the Americas, mid 1985. The labor intensive Barbadian plantation system came to be based on chattel slavery because the use of Africans and Indians as slaves was more economically viable than the use of white indentured servants, Edgar 1998 hours 37 minutes. As a result, the African population of Barbados increased from a few hundred before the introduction of sugar cane, to 20,000 just over a decade later, Edgar 1998 hours 38 minutes. With this in mind, it is little wonder that Barbadian immigrants to Carolina made up a sunny currency can't percentage of the planters who pro-currency ted from the enslavement of Indians, an even cheaper labor force than Africans. Between approximately 1670 and 1715 at least 24,000 and perhaps as many as 50,000 Indians were sold into slavery by the English alone, Galay. 2002 to 294 to 299. In 1708 the population of Carolina included about 10,000 whites, Africans, and Indian slaves. It is not surprising that Indian slaves made up only a fraction of Carolina's population, since natives were generally sold to Caribbean sugar islands from whence they had little hope of escape, Galay. 2002 to 300 to 301, 306. In fact, before 1715 Carolina exported far more slaves than it imported, Galay 2002 to 299. Unfortunately, few records were kept concerning the shipping of Indian slaves. The semi-clandestine nature of the Indian slave trade was due in part to an attempt by merchants to Avoid the taxation and regulation of the British Crown, Galay 2002-301. Despite the lack of quanti currency cation, it is apparent that Indian slavery had drastic effects on native social and political organization in the Lower South, forcing Indian groups to develop a variety of strategies for coping with the demands of European trade. Native political strategies in the 17th century South. The most appropriate units of analysis for the early historic South are polities, which are de currency net as collections of human communities that were politically organized. Hudson 2002, 16. Polities must be understood within their proper context. Mississippian polities can be seen as local. Variations of a political organization that was shaped by a number of widespread social and economic structures that made up what can justly currency ably be called the Mississippian world, Hudson 2002, 16. Recent research on the 16th century South has yielded insights into the previously opaque Mississippian period, Hudson 1997, Smith 2000. Much of
The success of this research can be attributed to the fact that 16th century polities can be called chiefdoms, and this term has a generally agreed upon meaning and usefulness to researchers, Hudson 2002, 16. On the other hand, 18th century Indian polities must be seen and studied within the context of the modern world, Hudson 2002, 19. This task is made diff currency cult because we do not have an analytical term such as chiefdom that adequately describes the character of 18th century polities, Hudson 2002, 20. The 17th century is even more a diff currency cult to understand, because the Indian polities of the 1600s must be viewed within the context of the collision of two worlds, the Mississippian world and the Atlantic world. The Atlantic world was one in which the European polities of the Western Atlantic became linked by travel and commerce in a way that was not possible before the 16th century. The modern world system, on the other hand, was essentially created during the colonization of the New World. When European polities began exploiting the resources of the New World, and when the market system that had developed in Europe during the 16th century became global in nature, it appears as though during the currency RST half of the 17th century, chiefdom organization gave way in most places to a much more egalitarian social system, one in which councils of men ruled through in registered dense and consensus. Three major mechanisms appear to be responsible for this decrease. In social strati currency cation and hierarchy, two of which were minor in comparison to the other, military losses at the hands of invading Spaniards, destabilization following the Spanish entradas, and the introduction of old world pathogens, Hudson 1997-417-426, Hudson 2002, 21-23. Of the three, old world diseases played the dominant role in altering the existing social and political system, which was based on genealogical proximity to ruling elite. During the second half of the 17th century, the survivors of the decline of the Mississippian world were politically and economically incorporated into the modern world system as primary producers for the commercial hunting and slaving industry, Hudson 2002. 24, Worth 2002 A colon 9 to 10. The three distinct European colonizing strategies that impinged on southern Indians during the 17th century combined to create an environment in which native peoples had available to them a variety of ways of coping with the intruding modern world. In contrast, throughout the 16th century and again by the second half of the 18th century, social and economic structures were such that they allowed only one truly viable political strategy. In the 16th century, virtually every society within the bounds of the Mississippian world was organized into some form of chiefdom. By the latter half of the 18th century, virtually all the surviving native people in the south claimed a connection to one of the five civilized tribes. In the 17th century, however, at least four different types of native political strategies can be identified in the lower south. The currency RST, until a more apt phrase is coined, can be called the traditional strategy. Polities pursuing this strategy were common among Indians administered by the Spanish, because the Spanish understood and preferred a hierarchical system through which they could rule the native populace. Worth 2002 B colon 39 to 64. In accordance with this, the Spanish did all they could to perpetuate chi registered Y lineages, making Florida something of a bastion for old ways, until they encountered slave raiding Indians such as the Westos. This is not to say that the Indians of Florida were not changed by the presence of the Spanish, for the friars went to great pains to bring natives into the fold of the Catholic Church.
because the Spanish supported. The noble lineages, however, polities that more than supercurrentially resembled. Chiefdoms were able to survive in Florida until the beginning of the 18th century. The Natchez Indians, located near Natchez Bluffs in present Mississippi, however, followed a traditional strategy despite having no sustained interactions with the Spanish.